counters in the audience. Oh, great, good. That's okay. Uh, if there are any bean counters in the audience, I present to you a pound of flesh. If my thing will work. Where's my pound of flesh? There we go. Um, to show that the investment was not wasted in these areas. I thought and did some stuff and some of it even was deemed worthwhile enough to publish. What I am more interested in talking about is how all this relates to my old advisor's constant admonition to us. I recall writing a very well-researched paper on the long distance economic engagements of Mycenaean citadels in the Argolid during grad school. And this paper had everything, page length, over a hundred footnotes and citations, all the major and quite a few minor sources consulted and cited. I was pretty proud of it and was sorely devastated when the good Professor Davis remarked at the end in his nigh unintelligible scrawl, so what? So what? Now, Jack was telling his grad student that he may have done a lot of research in compiling all of that information, but he hadn't told him anything new. I hadn't moved the conversation forward. His comment was on the specific paper, but his student also read something broader. So what? What's the point of this research? What's the point of you being here on this planet, working on this topic? So fast forward to 2018, I'm sitting in my writing space on sabbatical, and I hear news of uh, Reed's colleges changed to their Humanities 110 course. Evidently, the year-long study of the classical world was too white, too Western, and therefore needed to be infused with non-classical content. Yeah, so what? A humanities journal in the upper Great Plains loses a large part of its institutional support and is tasked with developing a self-funding model. This part of the university's larger initiative towards aligning resources on campus towards programs and disciplines that show demand and growth potential. So what? Several regional comprehensive universities reduce or eliminate departments in the humanities in favor of programs that emphasize turnkey majors, what I call them, those that by their name communicate a, a potential job at the end of the line. So what? And I was sitting in the Carolina Low Country, a landscape scarred with the effects of human enslavement transformed for the purpose of industrial agricultural production of rice and Sea Island cotton a system buttressed by the use of classical tropes and illusions to maintain the socio-political system. A landscape increasingly under pressure from environmental changes, economic development, and unsettled systemic social inequalities. So what? The ideas swimming in my head increasingly called for the application of computational literacy, geospatial applications, and a greater dialogue between humanistic, social, and natural sciences but this impetus, this impetus is struggling against structural philosophical barriers as institutions appear to be strengthening departmental programmatic and school walls and not dissolving them. So what? So what I'm going to do is talk about some of these issues, weaving possibly some of the things that I've been doing most often in collaboration with others. Um, one of the goals here is to suggest that what some may see as an erratic and even spastic splatter of work, I squirrel on crack, uh, is actually in an agenda with some focus, direction, and purpose. And one of the concepts that I've been working with is this concept of resiliency. It is a must, much massaged term these days. One could even say overworked in some places, yet it is a helpful construct. Basically, resiliency looks to understand the means by which a given system or entity is able to function within its overall environment and its responses and adaptations to a variety of other factors that it encounters. Borrowing a graphic here from Gunderson and Halling, who encapsulated the concept from the perspective of ecology, we can think of an entity moving through periods of organization, expansion or exploitation, conservation, uh, and then release or collapse fragmentation. And then we go back to reorganize things all over again. We can think of this also as a multi-scalar construct where a household and neighborhood, city, region, and state uh, are all working within their own processes yet interrelated, both hierarchically 
and laterally. And this interconnectedness known as panarchy provides a system with its greater capacities for handling the vagaries of its larger environment. Notions of resiliency, adaptations, and the interconnectedness between human environmental systems has been an interest of mine for some time, exemplified by our work in the AFCOT archaeological project and the continuation of those ideas uh, via the Climate Change and History Research Initiative at Princeton, started by my colleague, John Halden. The initiative grew out of our thoughts about how to better integrate the work of the archaeologists, historians, and paleoenvironmentalists. And uh, I valued my participation in the colloquium workshops over the years. Feel honored that they continue to let one of the old dogs in the house uh, for, their, uh, for our workshops and colloquium. So what? What can the 8th century Byzantine landscape and 12th century BC Eastern Mediterranean, two places where I've recently applied the constructs of the adaptive cycle and panarchy to discuss systemic resiliency and collapse, how do they relate to the state of classics, the humanities, in higher education today? Well, I take us back to the adaptive cycle. The Great Recession, slow defunding of higher education are two uh, pivotal elements in our most recent history. The former exposed fragility in the job market to the lower middle classes, latter increased the cost to the end user. These two events put pressure on the students and the families making increasingly the primary investment in higher education. With so much money invested, a return on investment is expected. In 2007, one as chair could expect questions from incoming freshmen as to what types of courses would be taught. In 2017, the questions were about internships and other high impact experiences that could lead to a job. Education is increasingly a means to an end, the end being food, shelter, and clothing. Now, it's not that this wasn't always the case. This was never, a, that this is somehow a, a new purpose for education, uh, but certainly a shift and an increasing focus on the end result is palatable. Nationally, Latin and Greek enrollments continue to slide. Financial models at colleges and universities shifted, allo allocating resources to places where demand required more supply. Focusing on the need to prepare students for the job market, the number of hours and majors increase, while the number of hours required for general ed education drops, or general education requirements are, quote unquote, met within the major. Those programs with strong enrollments in general education coursework, but no majors, see retiring faculty go. Their lines move to other areas of the institution and course offerings either contracting, offering fewer courses, or filled by non-tenure track temporary faculty. Humanities programs especially see themselves losing market share to programs that allude to a potential job sector or otherwise demonstrate a legitimate path to employment. At the same time, critical assessment shows, particularly in classics, uh, a structure that marginalizes diverse voices and seems out of touch with the pressing needs of the 21st century. From the perspective of the adaptive cycle, we would seem to be at a point where the old ways of doing things are increasingly less capable of meeting the challenges. So is the fragile system collapsing? Is there any resilience within this system? Some would say that it is time for reorganization of the discipline. For some, this reorganization needs to be pretty dramatic. For others, eh, tweaks on the margins. A few suggest things are oh, fine, and we just need to make better justifications for our existence. Very few would think that changes, that things are completely fine and with no need for any action at all. And I would say to an extent where one sits on this spectrum is determined by your perspectives on the field, the condition of your home department and your perceived peer institutions, and to an extent, one's own training pedigree and background. From where I was sitting in 2018 and where I sit now, the data, quantitative or qualitative, are pretty clear. We need to wake up. 
changes are needed. Fewer and fewer customers appear to be coming into the candy store, particularly because they don't know what you're selling, partially because you've not updated the flavors. And some of these are matters of perception. Some of these are deep matters of structure. And I wanna hit a couple of these. But before I do, I do want to address the diversity of the field of classics. Building a strong program in classics like any program is partially dependent upon the institution within which it resides. Techniques and approaches and curricula that work at one institution may be uproariously wrong for another. That does not lead to the idea that there's no solution gained from sharing ideas or learning from the successes or failures of others, but rather, there are likely few silver bullets. But uh, to go through some perceptions and realities. Number one, classics is poorly positioned for career prep preparation unless you want to teach or join the professorate. Well, actually we're pretty good at a lot of things. Classics prepares one for several career options. We just suck horribly at making the case. Of our alumni at the College of Charleston, 30% are found in education. Now, that's a significant percentage. It also means that 70% of our people do something else. Informal checks with other programs suggest that this ratio is neither high nor low. Um, and since 2012, I've developing, been developing a database of our alumni to help track their successes and travels through their careers. And the patterns roughly correlate to uh, with alumni surveys from a project conducted by the Associated Colleges of the Midwest, a consortium of 15 small liberal arts colleges. So you can see from the chart that you can, you can, and many do, do other things and teach Latin or join the professorate. Marketing, communications, legal professions, analysis, analysts, artists, in many cases, they're the bosses or in some ways in managing firms or fields or offices. What we really suck at is communicating the idea that studying classics is not a death sentence. Our alumni tell a completely different story. Uh, I can say what I can say about the college and the associated colleges of the Midwest can say something about their people. And there's interestingly strong overlap actually between a group of small liberal arts colleges in the Midwest and a large undergraduate comprehensive institution in the Southeast. Um, I'm hopeful that other programs have likewise taken an interest in seeing how their alumni uh, do in the quote unquote, the real world. But I can't say anything uh, across the discipline as a whole. Uh, we as a discipline have not leveraged the data scientists amongst us uh, which is to our detriment. What we also royally suck at is leveraging our alumni to serve as mentors and guides to our students. Communicating via our curricular and co-curricular structures, how exactly to translate a love for Greco-Roman civilizations to a career in something, quote unquote, other than war classics. We do a really bad job at communicating to our students that the idea of not going to graduate school or teaching is somehow failing. We do a poor job at communicating to high school students, parents, counselors, and administrators, the idea that classics and other humanities disciplines is a pathway worth supporting. And before I get labeled for turning classics into a jobs program and drinking the education is job training Kool-Aid, we all agree that classics majors can and are successful in a variety of careers and positions. I'm advocating that those connections need to be made more explicit, that we need to engage with our broader classics faculty, family, our alumni, to support each other, and that we, by doing so, will increase the perception of the field. Convincing the legislature for increased humanities funding is much easier when they see themselves as part of the family and feel that they've received help from us along their journey. I can say that we've made headway at Charleston, 
Uh, a revised major that better communicates the goals and takeaways of the program to students. An increased focus upon high impact experiences that help students transition to the next step in their journey. These are all good things. Since the uh, BA was relaunched in 2018, we've seen a dramatic increase in the number of majors. And with the addition of increased marketing and communications, most notably led by our new chair, Dr. Alwine, uh, the program is sitting today with strong enrollments nearly across the board. The extent to which our success is similar to other institutions, however, is harder to determine. Perception number two. Classics is elitist and white. Yep. Um, we can do and are doing better. Now there is so much ink on this and I and others in this room have made comment on this point in several venues at several points. When people talk about the need to break down the barriers, people note the need for curricular shifts, personnel shifts, and shifting resources to support underrepresented groups. At Charleston, I'm encouraged to see that we have done this. We see this as something to improve. And we've done things oftentimes before shouts from the blogosphere made this idea pressing. In terms of curriculum, teaching courses in ethnicity, constructs of enslavement and reception have become part of what we do. In our class 200 required by all majors of classics, specific modules focus on reception and the current perceptions and challenges of the field. As a part of the BA revisions, uh, a course on the modern applications of classics is now required for our BA students. Uh, a gift in 2019 established a scholarship for incoming freshmen interested in classics with a stated preference for minority applicants. And our hopes that the additional support makes this initial gift an endowed reality for the long term. Recent hires in our department have focused upon our connections to our colleagues in K-12 education, looking to improve our collective engagement with the broader family of classics and to widen the tent of who is quote unquote worthy of taking nourishment from this subject matter. The efforts at Charleston are not singular and other places are encouraging in their own way of diversifying the field. One can point to initiatives by Princeton University, University of Michigan and other graduate focused institutions to encourage and support minority students interested in the profession. The College of Holy Cross and other departments regularly feature the work of their non-academic alumni and their successes, demonstrating that classics holds a career path beyond the academy. Uh, the Sportula, a student organized professional organization, supports the endeavors of minority early career and students of classics via mini grant opportunities. The Multiculturalism, Race and Ethnicity and Classics Consortium encourages workshops, colloquia, and other initiatives to cultivate the broadening perspectives of the field. And the Mountaintop Coalition, started in part by our own Sam Flores and the Asian and Asian American Classical Caucus seek to support and encourage diversity in the field. The field in general is beginning to see the need for diversity. It's late in the game, but all right, glad for us to start taking these steps. As of late September, of the 16 tenure track job postings by the Society for Classical Studies, 10 mentioned diversity, equity, and inclusion, and five, 30% of those, those postings specifically mention diversity, equity, and inclusion topics as a prime area of interest for hire. Recent work from um, our small liberal arts colleges in the mid Midwest have also um, developed roadmaps of principles and guidance for contextualizing the field and assisting students of classics and in navigating the interplay between their studies and the next chapter of their lives. So in many ways, a good number of perceptions are being whacked at and a few structural pieces are being whittled. Um, these are all good and should be continuing and I believe they will only gain, gain additional speed and momentum as the years rolled forward. There are a couple of structural pieces I believe that need to be addressed. Some of these may be less seen as less important than the ones I've already mentioned, but I believe they are critical to determining whether we sink or swim as a discipline. So issue one, classics is Greek and Latin focused. 
all information is important, but some information is more important than others. All right, I said it. It's not that I don't enjoy a good couple lines of Homer. And it's not that I don't enjoy the insufferableness of Cicero. He's really insufferable, right? It's not that I don't enjoy teaching Latin, nor that I don't believe strongly that Latin and ancient Greek were inherently the best linguistic investments I've ever made. I have, however, over the course of my career, seen incredible people, smart, well-adjusted even, kind people, I mean, true rarities, pushed out for their lack of, lack of or poor capabilities in Latin and Greek. According to some, I should have been among them. I'm on more than one occasion, I've had to mentor a colleague on how to teach a part of ancient Greek Roman material culture for a class, not because they're a little foggy, but because they had never been required to take a course on Greco-Roman material culture, period. Someone explained to me why the objective genitive is more important than the Periclean building program for graduate school. Because as it sits right now, one is found in the required curriculum for graduate school and classics. The other is not. Highly encouraged, certainly, but not a default. I bring this up from a perspective of access and gatekeeping. No Latin and Greek, no grad school. In some ways, this is a moot point as long as PhD granting institutions and baccalaureate, baccalaureate institutions see themselves as locked in a cycle of mutually assured destruction. Requirements to graduate school are X. So X gets taught at the undergraduate level. When it's time to hire a new faculty member, they have to be able to contribute to the X part of the curriculum because that's needed for students to going off to graduate school and the cycle goes, right? Um, you can count the number of archeologists who are members of the Society for Classical Studies. I only became a member of, the, of, of that professional organization for classicists in 2018, uh, largely because I felt as I had needed to have standing when weighing in on issues of substance about the field of classics. The relegation of classical archeologists to the back bleachers has had a detrimental effect upon the discipline. They're your number crunchers, data managers, and the easy link to the STEM fields. But, you know, only if they know the difference between the data and ablative of means. The preferential treatment of the languages also impacts how we attend to students potentially interested in classics. When we do talk about K-12 education, it's almost singularly about our connections with Latin teachers and students of Latin. Why not human geography? literature, history, nationwide 214,001 students took the AP Human Geography exam in 2020. 5,821 took the Latin. Even via this metric, which has its own socioeconomic and other diversity issues, there are 36 times more students taking the Human Geography exam than the Latin. Mentioning K-12 brings me to a second structural issue. The K-12 education and the relationships and ways we engage between different levels of the educational system. By the time a person comes to college, a great many conversations have been had about the purpose and direction of a person's college experience. Other impressions and values have been imprinted. We can talk all we want about how awesome classics is for building out of the box change agents for studying hyper connected multicultural multi scalar human systems. But if we don't engage with the guidance counselors principals instructors and parents students will walk right past us and sign up for a quote unquote real major. They will see any prior Latin training that they may have had as good to get a leg up on a real language. Maybe they'll take a myth class for a gen ed humanities class, uh, but only if it doesn't conflict with the important coursework that they have to do. Engagement with K-12 can be hard. No glory is given by the academy for teaching nine-year-olds about stratigraphy with Plato. Play-Doh, not Plato. That would be really interesting. Um, no tenure decisions to my knowledge have been decided by the number of times one gives presentations on collapsing Mycenaeans 
or the craziness of Athenian democracy to North Central High School's human geography or government class. No bonus points for building visibility of the field. And yet, whether a department gets a new position or not is directly dependent upon demand for courses and the number of majors in one's program. If our only contact with high school students is via Latin programs, we've cut ourselves out of a tremendous amount of the market. Given that Latin programs are also connect, concentrated in schools that trend white and upper class, and you further reduced your abilities to increase diversity within our programs and the field writ large. The final structural issue has to do with status and data. Great amount of ink was spilled recently when Princeton dropped the requirement that all classics majors had to take Greek and Latin. It's now optional at Princeton. According to many, the sky was falling. Per capita, the College of Charleston has more majors than Princeton and by far more students enrolling in Latin. We've had a civ only major as one of our options for decades, as have other institutions. If Princeton's action was news, it was because an Ivy League institution with one of the lowest numbers of graduating classics majors in its class of institution changed its curriculum. How do I know this? I looked it up. The data is there for anyone who cares to look. Any chair or dean will tell you that decisions as to whether an academic discipline is supported are made less and less these days by rhetorical arguments and values and increasingly by data, by the numbers. Yet when it's time to talk about the future of the discipline, well, we, we don't have any hippos, right? But the next best thing in our minds, the uh, all my matres that academics instinctively view as the places where the thinky people are, the places where we went to graduate school, right? That's where the, that's where the big minds are. That's where we go, right? At the uh, Society for Classical Studies sponsored roundtable on the future of classics in 2019, the entirety of the panel was pulled from PhD granting institutions. One panelist, one panelist had administrative experience. Still, it was striking to have a panel sponsored by the Society for Classical Studies on the future of the discipline and to have not one voice from an institution that focused on the undergraduate experience. Not a single instructor from K-12. My point here is not to trash the perspectives of that panel or any of the panelists or the viewpoints uh, or others who have spoken about their perspectives on the discipline. I agree with many of the perspectives that are out there. However, I would point out that few of the voices that are regularly heard come from either A, administrative experience or B, positions of, of proven success. This is not to quiet people who are actively talking about ne the needed changes to the field, but rather that it would be really good for those who have had been around the yard a couple of times to be given the floor. None of the perspectives, my own included, benefit from a firm grasp of a reliable data set. The Society for Classical Studies has collected this information in the past, but they don't release it. The rationale given is that they would not want to provide information that could harm a particular program or department. Fair, except for the fact that the Modern Language Association has been publishing language enrollment data since the 1950s, and the Department of Education displays as public data all sorts of information about our respective institutions and programs. I'm ignorant as to what type of sensitive information is left or if that information would be relevant for understanding how to increase the number of people coming through our programs from a cross departmental analytical perspective. If we don't want to embarrass Wesleyan University because they've not graduated a classical language major in years, understandable, but that data is already out there. It is most difficult to understand patterns and trends, successes and failures, if one doesn't know who's doing what and whether what they're doing is necessarily successful. The leadership of our discipline taken from the leading minds of the classical world is scarce of number of crunchers. Evidently, they couldn't discern the difference between the data of an Abla of Absolute and are now working uh, for McKinsey. 
So decolonize the curriculum, employ better marketing of our applicability to the modern condition, liaise with K-12 educators, give interdisciplinarity some love, lead with data, redefine data by data, what is viewed as a, a successful program for the discipline and steal the good ideas of others. All of these elements discussed are in some ways dizzying and if written out would appear to the scholars a long list of tasks to do on top of the other thing that got us all into the business geeking out on Greco-Roman civilization. Right? As professors, when do we get to do our thing? Allow me to suggest that what I've, all that I've discussed can be encapsulated within the core purpose. We are not teachers, we are educators. Our role is not to point out that which is known, but that it is to draw out what is to be known. We are explorers. We draw out knowledge in the classroom and our laboratories and communicate our discoveries and insights in publications and other communications. Reformatting a class on state formation is not a matter of effective teaching. It is born directly from an engaged, from engaging in a field of research and wishing to draw out that new perspective to others. No resources for curricular improvement were expended. The revisions to our program in 2017 and those going forward were not supported by institutional programs, centers, or initiatives to improve student learning. We did that because we saw that the program was not reflecting the needs of our students and society writ large. The revisions were born from our intellectual interest in the field as it pertains to the modern world. Teacher scholar is a horrible term because it suggests a dichotomy. It doesn't work that way. Do we want to have students learn about how to weave discrete scientific and fuzzy humanistic data into a synthetic understanding of a problem? Find a faculty member who can put that thing together and make sure they have students as part of the journey. Do we want our students to have a deep understanding of how pluralistic political structures come into existence? And throw some resources to the faculty who can do that stuff and let them do it. The same goes for people interested in the power of informal social relationships, engendered social spaces, collapsing institutional structures, or com commemoration, or whatever else get the faculty's juices going, right? If institutions want engaging courses and programs that provide students with the perspectives and aptitudes to make substantial contributions to the world, they need to remember they're the, that they're not in the teaching business. They're in the innovation and exploration business. Curriculum, student experiences and opportunities, recruitment, retention, diversity, all improved and created via supporting the intellectual curiosity of the professorate. Administrations don't need to inspire the faculty. The faculty are already inspired. Geez, anybody who goes to graduate school for 10 years has got to be delusionally crazy fantastically hip and, and jiggy with whatever subject they're looking at, right? If you want golden eggs, feed the geese. So are we as a discipline on the brink, whoop, there we go. Are we as a discipline on the brink of collapse? Not necessarily. Collapse from the perspective of resilient studies comes when structures are so ingrained and institutionalized that there is inflexibility to respond to larger environmental changes. And there is evidence to show that we have the capacity to shift and change, to adapt and reframe our work to the needs and interests of the larger world. Whether we succeed to a large extent depends on our ability to identify those people, those programs and departments that are having positive results and replicate those success strategies elsewhere. To that end, the sharing of ideas and more importantly, ideas that have been implemented and shown to bear positive results is an imperative. This is an emerging endeavor. Which of our programs are thriving? We do a great job of identifying those programs under threat, but identifying success is something that the discipline as evidenced by the self-proclaimed professional, professional society of all classicists is reticent to do. For a discipline that touts the capacity to synthesize and analyze information, we are doing a horrible job of it. At the moment, we are blindly putting our hands on the elephant and looking to leadership 
from places which have not a track record of dynamism and change. The extent to which we can remove our gaze from the great tradition and towards sectors that seek to retain the essential elements of our field while successfully reconfiguring it for the 21st century will be the difference between success and failure, resiliency and collapse. If I could plot out the perfect classics program, I'd want to have a diverse group of colleagues with expertise in a whole lot of stuff that I know nothing about in specific, but yet hold the capacity to relate that abstract piece of nonsense to the larger whole, both for myself and the students. I would want faculty who see their part of the puzzle not only fitting into our knowledge of the classical world, but who see that piece fitting into the broader issues of humanity in our own condition today. I would want that to be a place where students learned how to be rock solid in their skills as classicists, but who would walk easily into law offices, the financial districts, the classrooms, federal agencies, named or unnamed, non-governmental organizations, communication firms, information hubs, and take over. I would want them to see themselves as highly adaptable, attuned to the global winds of change and ready to do the good works of changing the world for the better. I would have to be at an institution who knew that knew what its job was, not to teach, but to educate and discover. An institution that supported not good teaching, but research that directly fed into a dynamic and relevant student experience. Find me a place like that, and I think great things would be happening worthy of emulation. To that end, I lace up my boots and don the Indiana Jones hat. Uh, it's time to get busy. Years of talking and writing papers with paleoenvironmentalists, geologists, climatological modelers, and others have informed me that it's time to not only write together, but to truly work together with a project that ab initio carries the intellectual curiosity of us all questions that truly integrate the environmental, historical, geological, and archaeological data. As a classicist, I look to the Eastern Mediterranean. However, life has taught me that the best insights come from the intersections. Also, it is increasingly hard for me to look to Greece, while one of the most dynamic archaeological and environmental spaces in North America is in my backyard, a space which has its own comfortable history with the classical world similar to other colleagues in this room who see the intersections between their study of the Greco-Roman world and the immediate conditions that surround us, so too do I see relevance in exploring the dramatic socioeconomic environmental changes found in the Carolina Low Country. If we want a thriving field of classics where members of our larger collective family are omnipresent, it makes sense to see ourselves not as people focused upon a specific space and place, but as a people learning how lessons from that space and place can be applied to understanding and improving the greater world in which we live. So with that, uh, thank you for your time. And uh, I'm happy to hear the conversations. So thank you. You have some oh. time. We should probably oh. switch over the mic. Yep. Okay. We do have uh, time for some questions, and uh, of course, if there's any, can you encourage them to the Zoomers to? Yeah. Oh, you did. Oh, good. Okay. Fast. All right. So we'll open the floor to questions. Sir. Brandon, um, what would you suggest to us as Ah, uh, do your readings. <laughs> I, I, I think having a, an, an open mind and, and curiosity of how what you learn in one class meets and, and impacts and affects and, and integrates with something that you've learned somewhere else. One of, I think one of my greatest failures when I was a student was to think that I don't do math. Because, I'm a, because I do language and I don't do math. And now I do math and 
and and and that for me has been the, the greatest um, part of my my journey, whether it's an academic or, or as a as a human, is just keeping an understanding that and looking for the intersections and the relationships between one thing and the other. Yeah. Don't close your your don't close the shelf off. Yeah. Any other questions? We go back to that pie chart. The pie chart. Oop, pardon. Yeah, the pie chart. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There. Yeah. Yeah. So some of these make a lot of sense, uh, but three percent finance, four percent marketing. Yep. That, that makes a little bit less sense. I wonder about that myself. I wonder if you can comment on that. Um, actually, the numbers for, for, for Charleston, this is actually where we are, I think our numbers are, are, are a bit more divergent than our, our, our liberal arts colleagues in the Midwest. Um, marketing, think about what you're doing when you're looking at the Augustan uh, period, right? Dude, that's huge marketing. I mean, he's, he's, he's doing some heavy press, heavy, heavy court press marketing right there, right? Being able to distill complex ideas into um, an easily, easily un identifiable and understandable thing. That's, you guys do that really well. Um, and I think that's part of our, 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 our pull in that, is our ability to communicate. And we, we spend a lot of time of just trying to distill, distilling complex bits of data and information into kind of more easily digestible nuggets. We should actually relabel this propaganda. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, marketing communications is, is getting an idea out and 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 learning how to do that effectively. Sure. Uh oh. Yeah, well, I mean, we have um, field schools here in the Low Country at this institution are managed most often through the the. I mean, the, the courses on the books are in the anthropology department, and traditionally, that is where North American archaeologists are increasing. That's where you find them, and so uh, the the question that is i think a really good one is is how does that let's say field work related in the low country how does that look if we were to think about going off to do uh, seek a professional position as a classical archaeologist and today and today that's where we run up against this um the status issue in that we're you know people who are interested in classical archaeology you're still going to get a better shot of moving into a, a, a graduate program if that if that field experience is in the Mediterranean. But we're, you know, we're starting to, to chip away at some of those. Yeah. Hope that answered the question or addressed it in some way. Other. <laughs> so my, my question is, is there, are there any trends or similar patterns in the other, or is there really just a hodgepodge? It, 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 it goes into hodgepodge, one, two percent of, you know, especially as, as they're doing and um, as we're doing, we're, we're tying our alumni experiences to industrial sectors um with the with the bureau of labor statistics and so we got a lot of one percents which is basically you know one person is doing this and one person is doing that so it yeah it it, it yeah yeah ma'am um you mentioned that there is a serious focus on uh 
researchers who engage in nursing programs and it's not enough to focus on the opinions of people um, who are educating in undergraduate programs or K through 12. Um, what in your mind is the best ratio for like what is the your ideal ratio for PhD programs for undergraduate K through 12? Well, can we start at one person on the panel? <laughs> um, you know, it's, I would like to see us to have a bit more, I would like to see, you know, when we talk about the future of the, of the discipline in the field, I would, I would just simply like to see a bit more representation and people get, you know, the ways in which you get placed on or invited to panels has, has a lot to do with your connections and your networks. And sometimes, you know, you're too busy out in the trenches doing the things to really establish those networks and, and, and connections, um, which again, to me, part of the, 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 the benefit of, of going kind of with, a, with employing some data and analysis to our programs is we start to identify, it's like, who the heck is at the University of Dallas? Because dang, they're like going through the, they're going through the roof. What are they doing over there? Who's at the University of Dallas? Anybody? Where, in, yeah. So it's like, haven't seen her on the panel, but that program is, is doing some crazy stuff. You know, um, when you start looking at those numbers, yeah, it's, it's not normally, you know, they're, we're not picking from our A team. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Sam. So um, early in your talk, you you made some allusions of the way things were in the pandemic in 2007, which I think was a suggestion that the 2008 financial crisis changed how humanities programs are and sort of led into a lot of denial at the risk of many you feel old. <laughs> you know, I was in college in 2007, and I remember in major humanities programs in 2007, and remember um, the sort of regretful, will be gone era in which humanities departments were flourishing, even before the 2008 financial crisis. And you we were just I more old, depending on the question, right? Um, <laughs> That's, that's a, a really good question. Um, yeah, and yeah, even in 2007, we were, we were in a slump. I mean, people can say that the numbers didn't start with the Great Depression, they started way earlier. I would simply note that that was a place, that was a point where some gasoline got put on the fire. Um, and to the extent to which it's, we can have isolated pockets, or is this just kind of a national trend? I, you know, I think it's a matter of responding to, uh, I think all things are local and responding to what exactly is, you know, is your particular institution known for and how do you fit into that? And how can you, you know, find your niche within that space? And I think some, I think some places there, it's just, there's not gonna be a place for that. Um, in, in some places, I think that 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 discussion has already been had. But in places where they're starting to talk or starting to, you know, I think there's there's places where other institutions, other programs can can still guide the conversation and and find some some space to work with. I, I don't think I answered your question, Sam. Yeah. Oh. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I mentioned the University of Dallas, and I had some contact with them during the pandemic in Texas. And their, their approach seems to me to be a kind of, you know, their, uh, and, and it's, you know, one of the shared some other places, but uh, the, the content of classes has this enduring value. Um, and 
students and you know, it's into um, sort of universal principles in the texts and in the history. And um, whereas your approach seems more, you know, about uh, skilled acquisition. Um, and so I'm wondering if people that are trying to grow departments through the old fashioned arguments of, well, no, it's, so of course it's important because this is true and virtue and, you know, can make common cause with newer arguments um, that are about, um, uh, you know, yeah, no, I, I think there's, there's, I think there's room for both. Um, and yeah, anybody, I mean, people can, any, any, in any department or any program, right? The first thing that they're going to lay down is the fact that they do practical skills. Here's all the transferable skills that are found in this field and this discipline we have tremendous you know tremendous transferable skills everybody does transferable skills <laughs> that that is everybody's line the next question is and so what do you now provide besides transferable skills because that's what everybody says um, and that's when you come on the idea of like well we deal with big questions you know and we deal and 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 look at we look at the big issues and the big questions, right? We're, we're looking, I don't, you know, we're not looking at the emergence of, of the polis system in, in Greece. We're looking at social complexity and how that manifests. And we're using this as a test case to see how that, that, that works out. Um, but there's applicability of taking those, that idea and, and thinking about other societies and systems as well. Um, something that, that Dr. Alwan and I have, have, have talked about in the past is the ability, and one of the great things about studying Greco-Roman civilization is that it provides this level of abstraction. So if we want to talk about uh, race or ethnicity or, or identity, this is a great place to do it because it's not us. It's an abstract. So it's a way to sometimes talk about some, some sensitive issues or things that might be difficult, but in a way that in some ways is distant and abstractive, but it is easily applicable to a current condition. So there's a, there's great benefit to, to that. And, and, I, and I think there's complete, I think there, there has to be room for both of those. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. Yeah, and I'm happy to say somebody wants to keep talking. Thank you, Sam, for writing herd. <laughs> Thank you.